Well, hello there. This is Jack Daniel, and you are listening to Firewalls Don't Stop Dragons. Hello there, everybody. Welcome back to Firewalls Don't Stop Dragons. I am your host, Carrie Parker. Today we have episode 388 for August 5th, 2024. And I've got another wonderful interview for you. We're going to be talking with Jack Daniel, one of the co-founders of the now global phenomenon called Security B-Sides. Jack is just a, uh, Jack is a marvelously warm and caring person, which I hope will be evident from our interview today. He is also just a very interesting person. Almost, dare I say, a renaissance man. He, he has done a lot of very interesting things, only some of which we will actually discuss today. But we're going to talk about uh, some really important hacker history, including the conference which he helped to found called Security B-Sides. Uh, they are now a global thing. In fact, they've just crossed 1,000 conferences that have been held since their uh, first one back in Vegas. Las Vegas is kind of the, the home, the mothership, but uh, they have been happening literally all over the planet. Jack will have some of the figures later on in the interview. They're, they're really amazing. So we'll talk about how this all got started. Uh, we'll talk about how these conferences are different from other conferences, including the ones that kind of inspired them. Then we'll also get his take on on modern hacking, including things like bug bounty programs and corporate bug hunting teams like Google's Project Zero. We'll talk about responsible disclosure, and then we will get philosophical about community and family and some things like that. It's a, it's a really wonderful interview. You sit back, relax. Uh, it's going to be a nice little fireside chat. Real quick, before we get to the interview, Jack does throw down a little bit of lingo. I just want to make sure you're clued in so you understand what he's talking about. Uh, many of these we've talked about before, but just to make sure, he talks about the CDC. Uh, that, in this case, is not the Centers for Disease Control. In this case, it's the Cult of the Dead Cow, which you might remember from my interview with uh, Death Veggie and Omega, a classic OG hacker group. Uh, he also talks about Loft. In this case, that's L0PHT, which is, yes, a takeoff on LOFT. There was a famous Boston area hacker group, one of whose members is Space Rogue, uh, which we'll talk about today. He's a friend of, of Jack's. Uh, and I'm actually reading Space Rogue's book right now about the Loft, which is really good. Jack will briefly mention Back Orifice, which, yes, is pretty much the play on words that you think it is. Uh, it's a takeoff on Back Office, which was a Microsoft product. The, the Loft group actually put out a, a Windows management remote management tool that was actually quite handy for people who couldn't afford Microsoft's tool set. I actually have a very kind of explicit 25th anniversary challenge coin for Back Orifice, which I got directly from Death Veggie. That's quite interesting. I'm very proud to own. Jack also mentioned Jeff Moss, uh, a.k.a. Dark Tangent, who's the founder of DEF CON, uh, who I've interviewed a couple times. If you have not heard those and you find these hacker conference history things interesting, you definitely need to check that out, along with my Cult of the Dead Cow interview. He talks about OWASP, which is a, an acronym for Open Worldwide Application Security Project. It's a group of people who put out, uh, among other things, their top 10 list of web application security problems, like kind of like a most wanted list. He talks about RSA, mostly in terms of the conference, but RSA is a company based on the initials of the folks who basically revolutionized public key cryptography, which was uh, Rivest, Shamir, and Edelman. And he briefly mentions DEF CON goons, which is just what they call their staff members. Okay, so we'll also cover a couple more things that we talk about, but I want to wait till we actually go through the interview first. So let's dive into my wonderful interview with Jack Daniel. <laughs> Jack Daniel is a storyteller, a wanderer, a comic, bartender, blacksmith, a luthier, historian, mechanic, and world's oldest millennial. He's also one of the founders of Security B-Sides. Uh, welcome to the show, Jack. Thank you. It's great to be with you. We've been talking about doing this for a while, haven't we? We, we have. <laughs> and I, I, I met you a while back, and I'm sure you didn't know who I was. Uh, but I probably somehow met you through Josh or uh, Josh Corman. Uh, but I, I think the first time I actually cornered you and, and tried to say, hey, let's do a podcast, I think was uh, the, maybe the 10th anniversary B-Sides here at RDU. Yeah, that I, think I believe so. Yeah, I think yeah, so. Yeah, and so I pulled you aside and said, so we would so we talk about this for some time now. And I'm really glad we finally got this together. And one of the things ever since I talked to 
well, I, honestly, ever since I talked to Jeff Moss, but also some of the guys from CDC, I just find, you know, old hacker history fascinating. And, and, and so I really wanted to kind of pick your brain uh, on some history and things that I want to make, you know, make sure that our audience is aware of and also just kind of make sure are captured for posterity. Because I think, uh, you know, I think as is want for hackers, a lot of the things that happen don't really get recorded. <laughs> so, so, you know, except maybe on police blotters or something. Right, so right. Um, <laughs> if they're if they're captured at all. So I there's a lot of great stories. And I just wanted to, you know, take some time to pick your brain for a little while on that and uh, see what we can uh, bring to the audience. So um, let's let's start with the basics. Tell me a little bit, little about yourself and a little bit about security B sides. How did that start? Why was it created? That sort of thing. Yeah. Okay. So um, I, uh, man, I, I, I have uh, people have asked me like career advice and um, do dumb stuff and be lucky is not highly repeatable. <laughs> um, uh, make a lot of mistakes and then be lucky really just isn't advice I like to give, but it worked for me, right? So a long, long time ago, I was a mechanic. I specialized in uh, Renault and Jeep vehicles and through the years worked on all sorts of uh, things, wonderful and horrible from Saab and Peugeot and to, you know, 80s Chrysler, 80s uh, GM Cadillac olds, things like that. But, you know, decades ago, we ran into an issue at the dealership and uh, I had to look at my own parts because the parts department fell apart. Next thing I know, I worked in the parts department, uh, which was one of the first departments computerized, and I wasn't afraid of the computers. So while running parts operations and service operations for a, a dealer chain in the, the Boston area, I spent more and more time using computers as a user. But also, since I wasn't afraid of them, I did basic admin stuff and maintenance on the systems. And then over the years, through the 90s, the amount of computer in our world exploded. And uh, by the end of the 90s, they said, why don't you just take care of our computers? And so I did. And if you were dealing with computers back then, you learned about security, whether you wanted to or not. <laughs> uh, and if you thought it was uh, entertaining, fun, or you had an aptitude for it, you drifted that way. And so, you know, somewhere, I don't know, 20 years ago, not quite. Um, I saw the handwriting on the wall. I saw the giant shakeup coming for the auto industry and um, joined some friends who were working at a Staro German firewall UTM vendor and had a great time working at a Staro uh, at a variety of roles. Uh, I did a lot of community building for them as well as uh, support roles and all sorts of other things because it was a small company, especially the U.S. office. And mm. when we were acquired by Sophos, I made the jump over to join Ron and Jack um, Ron Gula, uh, Jack Hufford, and Renaud Dureason at Tenable. Uh, they had been friends for a while. We had tried to, you know, find a place for me there a couple of times, and either they didn't have anything or I was too happy at Astaro. But finally, I jumped in and joined there and spent uh, 11 years with uh, with Tenable um, in a variety of roles, from being the first person with the title product manager through uh, a variety of other things. And so that's, a, you know, the, the short version. So I used to fix stuff, and then I continued to fix stuff. And the stuff that I've fixed has varied through my life. But I've built and fixed stuff all of my life, whether it was at the keyboard or on the wrenches. So there's the short version. The important to B-sides is that um, when I made that transition to full-time IT uh, and started dealing with security issues as well, I had no resources. The only thing I could do was uh, figure it out for myself. And then I discovered the amazing uh, user group community that we had in the Boston area at that time. And it's still pretty impressive. But I, I found a user group in the Providence area. I was south of Boston. So Providence and Boston were both a pain to get to about equally, but mm. it was worth it. <laughs> so I found uh, user groups that were great, particularly one in the Providence, Providence area. And the uh, the guys that had been at it a while were happy to share what they knew, well, you know, point me in the right direction on some problems. And then as I made some progress, I started sharing what I had done. It's like, I just did the exchange 5.0 to 5.5 upgrade. Uh, my liver will never recover from <laughs> how much I had to drink, you know, things like that. But I would yeah. walk them through it. And eventually those became formal presentations because I couldn't have done my job without the help of others. And I realized mm. that others were in the same situation. Mm -hmm. So I saw the value in those communities and uh, eventually joined the boards on some of them, was an advisor to some others. And, you know, that was that. And interestingly, that was a time when 
I was aware of, but not engaged with folks like CDC and Loft. I certainly was a user of uh, Loft tools because I couldn't afford the commercial ones. <laughs> and and uh, running a full back office, you know, NT4 back office suite, back orifice was uh, a phenomenal help for me. Mm. So uh, it, it was parallel, but I was unaware of that. I was just too busy trying to run the computer systems that I was doing and wasn't engaged with you know, early DEF CONs or any of that stuff. I was focused on my uh, my weird little world of automobile dealerships, travel agents, law offices, real estate ventures, and other things that the family I worked for did, and then, you know, moonlighted with some other uh, organizations until I transferred. So, um, you know, that goes back to understanding the value of community and how it is that we move forward uh, yeah. together. At uh, about that time back, um, uh, one of my hobbies started to take off, and that was playing, you know, blacksmith. And I still say I'm a 30 year beginner uh, at heating and beating metal. <laughs> But again, I joined a, a New England blacksmiths, a phenomenal group in the Northeast, and I realized I had no skills. I couldn't demonstrate things, but I knew which end of the broom to use and had some organizational capacity. So I joined the board of directors and helped steer that organization for for many years. And, um, you know, I, I, as a result of pitching, you know, providing what I could provide, which was not the craft skill, but it was the tedium. I became friends with some of the bless, best blacksmiths in the United States, and it wasn't mercenary. I wasn't trying to do that, but it turns out if you step up and pitch in, you will often find that you're accepted regardless of your skill level if you actually contribute, right? Mm. And and one of the things, and this is true in tech too, when you show something that you've just learned, even if hundreds of thousands of people have learned it before you, if you actually think about how you got there, you bring a unique perspective to it and mm -hmm. it actually mm -hmm. adds value to the community. And also there's some other poor schmuck who has yet to learn this. And if right. you can save them some pain, here we go. So there's a whole long winded way of, of getting up to 2009, 2007, eight. A lot of people were grumbling about a lack of community feeling in uh, over commercialization in some of the, the commercial events. And there was just a general discontent with uh, with things. It always fascinates me to find out how people got into their security practices because it's almost never directly. So many of the people that I have interviewed have gotten there tangentially or almost serendipitously from from somewhere else. So that's fascinating. All right. So now, how did how did B sides come about? How how did that whole thing get started? So in 2009, Jeff Moss, Dark Tangent, had just sold uh, Black Hat to UBM, mm -hmm. the global media conglomerate. And Jeff had always called Black Hat his sellout conference. Uh, that was his term. Uh, I don't know if he still uses that. He had just sold to uh, UBM, the global media conglomerate. And they were struggling with how to treat the community because there's a real community around Black Hat, but it's a lot more corporate feeling mm -hmm. than the the community around DEF CON, for example. And they were struggling with trying to bring new content in, trying to find the right balance, which at that time they were still at Caesars, so they were severely capacity constrained. They were capacity constrained for where the exhibitors could be, and they were in your face, literally blocking the <laughs> aisles at times. Uh, so that was there were some frustrations about that, and people started getting the rejection notices. They you know they got declined from Black Hat, and uh, by that time, a lot of us in the hacker world and in the security world had found each other on Twitter. Um, shout out to Jen Leggio, Media Fighter, had played connect the dots. She realized a lot of people in different communities were using Twitter back 2007, 2008. And she, as she traveled for work, started playing Connect the Dots and made the first security twits list. And there were like, I don't know, 50 or 60 of us on it. And then there were 100. And then there were 1,000. And it took off long before Twitter had any list functionality. And it used to be great. That was before celebrities and journalists and politicians were there. Uh, and we actually had conversations, uh, not just arguments. We actually had intelligent conversations. It was amazing. It's hard to believe now when you look at Twitter. Right. But with that background, a few of us started chatting about who got turned down and why. And it's more, it's both more complex and simpler than this, but I, I like to describe it this way. We saw some talks that we thought, oh, that's cool, uh, except 
20 or 30 people want to see this talk and black hat needs hundreds, if not more mm -hmm. in, a, in a room to justify what they do. Got it. It was appropriate of them to decline this talk. However, it's really too bad. There's not a place for them to do that. We saw some talks that should have been turned down, but there was something cool about them. Some of them were incomplete or some of them were per poorly presented, but looked like they probably would be awesome. Uh, some were ignoring prior art or something, but there were things, there was something about them that was really interesting. It just was not ready for the big stage or the person was not ready to present at the big stage. And we said, too bad there isn't a place for people to give talks, get some feedback from the community, maybe even get mentorship, develop the project, develop the code, develop their skills, whatever it was. And, you know, it's really too bad there's not a place to, to for people to give these things. And then there were others that we were just like, that's I I'd love to see that. But that's not really a black hat talk. Hmm. And we realized we had been saying too bad there isn't a place through hmm. a multi day conversation. And so we made it happen. We didn't think we were changing the world. Uh, we were kicking around ideas. Uh, Chris Nickerson, Mike, Don and myself were the the loudest voices in the conversation, <laughs> but there were a lot more. And, you know, the uh, French festival, the music festival in, in Britain was uh, a thing at that time. And Mike had suggested fringe, but then it was because uh, it was on the fringes of Black Hat. Mm -hmm. But then we, we, we opted for B-sides, the B-side to the A-side single for us old people who have, <laughs> have vinyl. You know, mm -hmm. you, you, you know the, and the, the point of that was that we were initially a B-side to Black Hat. You know, the, the A-side was what got played at AM you know showing my age again <laughs> going back into the 60s and set early 70s and am radio the hits were on that but the deep cuts late at night or on fancy new fm um mm. were the were the b-sides and that's where you you know let the drummer prove that he or she was actually a musician or whatever the weirdness was <laughs> it was cool stuff but not for the masses mm. and so we did an event and there was Chris had rented a house in Vegas and he said, there's a big room. There's a wedding chapel. Why don't we just have talks there? If you don't want to go to the talk, go to the kitchen, grab something to eat or drink, jump in the swimming pool in the backyard, have side conversations elsewhere. And so we made it happen. And we had some sponsors pitch in some money. We put out a tip jar. People threw some cash in. Nobody got email addresses or anything. It was just uh, some visibility. And then, you know, we had a whole bunch of talks. So I again, I, DEF CON seems to have started this way, and so many of the other things in the hacker community seems to have kind of started on a lark. It's just amazing, and especially to see how far it's come. Okay, so what were some of those? What were some of those first talks like? The first talk ever, Jay Cran, Jonathan Cran gave a talk about the transition from being a pen tester to managing the team of pen testers. And I do him a great disservice, but it's funny, so I'll say it once again. Um, a, a, a cruel summary of his talk was, it turns out it's easier to break stuff for a living than manage a team of people who break things for a living. <laughs> um, and we're not the only industry that does this. Uh, most do, but we do tend to promote people without without the tools, without the training, uh, especially yeah. management training. We're, we're bad <laughs> right. at it. Most industries are. We're especially bad at it. So that was great. You know, it was a great talk. And it's the kind of talk that there are a handful of people who would want to hear at almost every event anywhere, right? It's, it's a valuable mm -hmm. talk. There are way more than a handful of people who should hear that. Right. <laughs> every right. That's a whole other story. Uh, so that yeah. was the first one. There were talks that you would expect, things on... Uh, you know, HD gave the first talk on Warvox, but it had to be no recording, no press because he hadn't sanitized the data yet. And it mm. was just amazing. And it was uh, it was free form. So, and it was HD speaking at HD speed. Um, <laughs> so it also, besides being about Warvox and the development of that, it was about data ac acquisition and the various data platforms from from MySQL to Postgres to, you know, NoSQL tools that were able to ingest the, rate, the data at the rate he was gathering it. And so it was like this multi-pronged uh, talk, and it was really amazing. There were a whole variety of things. Val Smith gave a, an absolutely delightful hacker geopolitical view of the world rant, part performance art. Um, it was brilliant. <laughs> It was not a thing that uh, – yeah, yeah, you probably could have seen that at DEF CON at the time. Certainly, Sky Talks was still doing things like that. 
but it was great. The the one session that uh, got a lot of attention, Aaron Jacobs, Security Barbie, Barbie had done uh, had planned to have a fundraiser pillow fight among some of the women <laughs> in the industry, and people got really upset about how sexist that was, even mm. though it was women who wanted to do this and they were poking fun at those sort of images right, right but right. people didn't understand that and uh so instead she put together a panel called feathers will fly and it was a discussion of gender issues in our industry at that time this is july of 09 and this is the year mm -hmm. that was often referred to as the the frat house year, but that was beyond standing room only. It was absolutely packed. She had a panel of amazing people, JJ, Jen Jabish. Um, I'm going to forget all sorts of amazing people, friends. Um, I used to be bad with names. Then I got old. Um, <laughs> there was at least one practicing attorney. At least one was still in college. People from East and West and North and South whose social and political views varied. And it was lively, but it was, yeah, it was lively, I think is the right word, but it was great. And at the end, they all sipped champagne and cheered at having been able to air this conversation. And, there, and so we just, well, now what? And people wanted more. So it took off. Uh, on, we didn't really expect it to, but it took off. Some folks led an event in Mountain View at the end of that year in 2009. We did one during RSA. In San Francisco, February of 2010, 10 days later, uh, Ben Tomhave and I put on an event in Austin, Texas, even though no, neither of us lived there. Um, the team that wanted to start it ended up not being able to take off. And so we knew if we had an event in Austin, it would pick up and run by itself after the first one, which it did. Um, so we were in Austin, did an event in Boston, the, the Denver DC-303 crew made one happen in Denver. We were back in Vegas and realized we had started something. So I try to describe this to other people and how B-sides and DEF CON are much different than other conferences, but there's a lot more B-sides than there are DEF CONs. I mean, and there are several DEF CONs now. There's the main one in Vegas, but there are, there are other ones that they hold around the world. But B-sides has always been this kind of local community driven thing. There is the one in Las Vegas. And part of what I like about B-sides, I think, is the simplicity. You have some control over how these things work and you've got some ground rules so uh, why, don't you, why don't you explain how that works? Hey, you know, the rules got established in those early days, and they're really pretty simple. It's um, don't sell out because we were all sick of scan and spam type events. Mm. You know, you can't buy speaking slots. But unlike the other ones, we feel it's important to treat our sponsors well. You know, if if you've exhibited, if you're in the industry and have been an exhibitor at some of the bigger or even smaller, highly commercial events, they don't always treat you well to be kind to them. Uh, they treat you like garbage oftentimes. Uh, you're just a cash cow. We absolutely yeah. want, we want, especially smaller and local organizations that can't afford or can't justify the expense or would just like to actually have conversations with people instead of scan and spam. We want them to f be part, not just feel like, but be part of the, the B-Sides community and the hacker community. So explain what you mean by scan and spam. So scan and spam, if you've ever been to Black Hat or RSA or... Honestly, any tech conference. <laughs> yeah. They scan your badge and then you get email. And if you want to talk tech uh, at a lot of those booths, you can't even talk tech at the booth. There's nobody who actually understands it. What they want to do is schedule a demo uh, and that's it. Um, they just scan and spam. And the quality of having been in the vendor world, the quality of those leads is garbage. You know, but it's it's part of the game that the industry plays. So we don't want that for B-sides. We want people to sponsor the event, to be part of the community, to, to support the community, to meet people, to network. Recruiting has been a big reason to sponsor B-sides events over the years. Unfortunately, we're having some uh, contractions in the industry, to put it mildly. Mm. We're, we're having some some pretty ugly times right now, but it's still out there. It's still how you find things. So that's, the, you know, that's the, the don't sell out part of it. The keep it open is simple. It's, it's not a curated content event. You know, you can invite one or two speakers, uh, but it needs to otherwise be all your content from the community, open call for papers and get what you get. And then, you know, the last thing we just ask people to stay in touch with us. Um, there's no formal event agreement, but stay in touch with us at info at besides.org to let us know what's going on so we can keep track of events. And 
you know, it's it's really fairly informal. It's fully decentralized. I get too much credit for it. I've been <laughs> doing administrative stuff and uh, cheerleading and uh, mentoring, you know, since before that first event. But besides, it's fully decentralized. Each event is organized by, uh, you know, a, a local team or is independently organized. So the, the team that does Las Vegas, for example, is uh, mostly not in Las Vegas. Uh, hmm. But, you know, there, there are teams that uh, that come together to make the events happen, and most of them are, are locally focused. And so, you know, it just exploded from there. And yesterday was the second uh, annual event in Umea, Sweden, which is not a city most of us know, but it is a college town, university city. Uh, so as of yesterday, 984 B-sides have happened since we wow. did what we thought was a one-off event at late July of 09. That brought us to 244 cities in 65 countries have held B-sides. Wow. There are 65 more already scheduled for the remainder of this year. Nine of those are first. <laughs> so do you know which fits. one of those is going to be the thousandth? Yeah. So on 19th July, uh, there will be three B-Sides events, one in Mexico City, one in uh, Basingstoke in the UK, and one uh, here in the US, Albuquerque, New Mexico. It will be the first. No, it'll be the second Albuquerque. That's right. Uh, but anyway, those three will be in a three-way tie, 998, <laughs> 9, and 1,000. So event 1,000 will be uh, July 19. A three-way tie. And I'm not sure where we'll, we'll end up this year, but last year there were 129 events around the globe. There are a couple of places that are starting to pick up. The vast majority are still here in the United States, um, but there have been quite a few in Canada. The first one outside the U.S. was in Berlin. That, went, that became something else, but it got revived again. But there are more and more events happening across India. There is uh, an interesting cultural thing about... Uh, uh, advancement and recognition that I don't fully understand, but it's been explained to me. And uh, it, it appears that younger generations in India are more eager to just make things happen, just get it mm. done, especially with a hacker mindset. Let's just do this. And so there's a real acceleration of events all across um, all across India, um, also across Latin America. Brazil has uh, a handful of events and has more on the way. But all across Latin America, there are more and more. Um, as a matter of fact, besides uh, Sao Paulo is the uh, the event city that has held the most events by far because they have done up to four a year. Oh, wow. They started out doing a couple a year, and then they, they did them, because it's Brazil, they did them during, like, World Cup games, and they would have a talk between games and stuff. And uh, so, anyway, that's that. You know, we, we um, it's, it's an amazing thing. We speak to about 80 people a year who inquire about doing a B-Sides. Probably about 30% of those become real, but... Um, since the pandemic, everything seems to be taking longer, but it's still, you know, we're, we're probably bringing mm, 20 new events a year on lately. So you mentioned people reach out to you to, to do a B-Sides thing. I don't know if you want to call them franchises or what, yeah, what you call these little breakoffs, but well, yeah. what, what does it take to do that? Do, you, do they have to get approval? Is there yes. any sort of... So it well, is I, informal. Uh, in the early days, we had a formal organization. It was a 501c3, in the, um, but to really support organizations, we would have had to raise money for the the central org and then impose regulations on the people we gave the money to. And to do it outside the U.S. would have effectively required building an NGO. And mm. that would have sucked all of the available money away from individual events. And so we <laughs> let, the, let that central org kind of devolve and its community policed. Uh, policed is not a good – it's community – Guided, I think, is the best word. Um, Governed? No, nah, that's too strong a word. <laughs> too Way strong. too strong a word. Uh, <laughs> that now, the, the original 501c3 still exists. It is now the parent org behind V-Sides in San Francisco. And as stewards of the global community, they hold intellectual property, trademark, copyright. Uh, they handle okay. domain reg and things like that. Uh, luckily, and we can't afford it anyway, uh, luckily we haven't really needed to bring the lawyers in because it's you know, the community usually applies pressure 
to to steer things. And, you know, there are a whole bunch of communities. There's the local community where the B-sides happens. There's the global community. There's the organizer community. Uh, but as far as a franchise, there's no formal event agreement, but the process is send us a note to info at bsides.org. Tell us what, what and where you want to do an event. We have an introductory phone call. I am trying to back away. Uh, I, mm. it's, this is... The most significant thing that I have done professionally and as a hobby, too, um, in my life. However, I've been doing it for 15 years, and it's time for fresh ideas. Um, also, I've retired, and I spend way more time offline, as you know from my obnoxious uh, email <laughs> autoresponder. So what you do is you send a note to info at. For years, it was Michelle uh, Klinger uh, would jump in for a few years. I have done it off and on most of the past 15. There's a whole team that's that's stepping in. Uh, Siggy, who reads, leads Reykjavik, does a bunch now. But what that call is, is we go over the rules. We share some experiences. We explain the history. Like I talked about, this is, you know, the rules are simple. This is what it came from. This is the ethos of B-Sides. We share some experiences. We talk about things that we like to talk about. I share some personal things like you will always hear me talk about participants, not attendees, because mm. if you show up at a B-Sides, I want you to feel like you're there to participate in the community yes. and in the conversation. Absolutely. Yep. Uh, and so, you know, whatever your badge says, but if you go to Vegas, your badge says participant, unless it has speaker, sponsor, staff, artist, whatever, mm. you know. Mm -hmm. You know, we talk about things like that. We talk about what we figured out. Why did B-Sides accelerate? It's easy to do. It's not a TEDx, not a laundry list of rules. Uh, it's not an OWASP. You don't need an existing chapter. You need to want to do it and make it happen. And it's all on you. We can't help you with money. We can't help you with call for papers. You have to make it happen. What you get is the B-Sides name, the connection to the local and global communities that you get through B-Sides. You get, you know, social media amplification of messages and cheerleading. You get some mentorship and the connection to the amazing community. But it is fully decentralized. Everybody's on their own for their own events. So without a formal board, there is a mail list, a Google group of organizers, past, present, and prospective future organizers. And that acts as a community council, for lack of a better mm -hmm. term. And it's – we listen to everyone that's part of the community. But the organizer's community, you know, first among equals or whatever, you know, how, mm -hmm. how are we – because these are people that have blood, sweat, and tears and uh, often money into making B-sides a thing. And they understand some of the things that you might not sure, – yeah. if you haven't – if you've just – participated but not tried to get sponsors or feed people or whatever but we you know we try to keep everybody uh posted and mostly that that mail list is used for sharing experiences answering questions every now and then there's a hey is this right for b-sides kind of thing and on extremely rare occasions uh you know if somebody has something they're unhappy about we discuss it there and uh, we have been remarkably lucky because there's really no enforcement other than through the community. I think we have only had to ask one team to not use the B-Sides name in the hmm, future. Okay. Well, that's, that, um, that's pretty good, actually. Honestly, uh, if part of that team came back to us now uh, years later and excluded one or two problematic people, <laughs> we'd probably say, yeah, you're uh, you're on double secret probation. Kid. No, wait. um <laughs> references that the children don't get uh so anyway oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh yeah so uh you know we we try to let people do their own event and i'll be honest a lot of the events are far more commercial than our, our than you know some mm. of our ideals but it's hard to get money especially these days and people come up sure. with creative ways but I think overall it is it is really maintained true to that that community vibe, and the smaller events often have a more profound impact per capita than the big mm -hmm. ones. I love B sides Vegas, I love B sides San Francisco, uh, B sides London. Those cities have other options for you. There's no security conference other than B-Sides in Umea in, Switzerland, in uh, Sweden. They're trying to relaunch B-Sides in Memphis. I think we had 32 people there at the first event, but it was a <laughs> catalyst for other events in the area. Sure. Uh, the first one in Detroit launched a whole movement that completely went well beyond B-Sides because people started having a conversation. 
you know, so uh, it's like, why don't we know each other? Oh, well, you know, this is how long ago that was. They spun up a uh, whatever the messaging platform du jour was back then. Uh, anyway, they spun something up and started things. And it, it, so the, the ones that are in underserved or unserved communities often have a more profound impact on the people that participate and the companies that sponsor. Okay, so like, uh, you know, many key players in the hacker community have played important roles in founding these and other conferences, Jeff Moss, for example, and, and, and yourself, uh, you know, and then there's hacker groups like the Loft and Cult of the Dead Cow. There's a lot of overlap. There's a lot of cross-pollination. So I'm kind of curious as to, as these things have grown over the years, the, the conferences and such, what kind of influences have other things had on you? How uh, how much influence have you had on others? What some of the cross-pollination, how have things evolved Hopefully for the better, but maybe for the worst. How have things changed over the years? Well, uh, we uh, we tried to have a good relationship with Black Hat, and it worked for a couple of years. Um, and DefCon too, right? Or, uh, and I mean, DefCon, how much? DefCon, we never had formal conversations in the early days, but we always made sure to um, give deference to DefCon. As a matter of fact, we moved from being the same days as Black Hat, Wednesday, Thursday, to being Tuesday, Wednesday, specifically because a lot of the people that participate, and including volunteers and staff uh, at B-Sides Vegas, but also just people that come to the event, have, you know, want to be fully engaged with DefCon. Mm -hmm. And uh, so by moving a day earlier, that means that Thursday is, depending on what your role is, uh, if you're a goon at DefCon, you can get right over there Thursday and get to it. Um, if you don't need to be at DefCon on Thursday and you hang out at the pool party until four in the morning, uh, you can sleep <laughs> on Thursday, um, you know, eat, yeah. eat a healthy, balanced meal or two that day, get some sleep, uh, take two or three showers to stock up for the weekend and then be ready for DefCon. And right. so... You know, there's a, a lot of overlap between people who are uh, part of the, the DEF CON machine, goons and others. And we've always tried to have a, a healthy relationship with them. And we do we a lot of friends back and forth. Black Hat, we don't have an adversarial relationship anymore, <laughs> uh, but they're commercial and we definitely do draw some from them. Okay, so <laughs> there's obviously a story there. What is the history there? What what is the story with you guys at Black Hat? It is unfortunate that the way that started, um, the team, you know, getting inside baseball here, but and I hate that term too. But uh, get, getting uh, in into nuts and bolts, the team that was uh, responsible for social media at Black Hat in two thousand nine had realized how many tech people were on Twitter, and they were horrified that there are far more people were talking about B-sides, the little mm. couple hundred person event than the couple thousand, <laughs> you know, the multi thousand person event on Twitter. And what they failed to recognize was they were in our playpen. B-sides was built on Twitter. All of the conversations, public and private, were on Twitter. Everything was done on Twitter. So the engaged people in Twitter knew about B-sides because that's where we built it. And um, it that just didn't click with them. And mm. so there were some people at Black Hat that were very upset and they were upset with me for years, which was kind huh. of awkward because UBM, having been in vendor land at Sophos and certainly at Tenable, we spent a fair amount of money with with things under the UBM banner. And so there were people that would, you know, want to see me and whoever else I was working with take us out to dinner or drinks or invite us to a reception uh, because we were a customer of theirs. And then there were other people who would like leave the room when they saw me walk in. So uh, it was weird, but it would be like, you know, if you, if, if you have a, a sports team and um, you know, you're, you're the visiting team here in Brunswick, Georgia and uh, the, the Glen Academy team gets better coverage than you do as the visitor. Um, <laughs> it's the home field advantage, home team, whatever. We were on our turf, and that really set a bad tone. And I really wish that had not been a thing because mm. there's no need for it to be adversarial. But uh, anyway, that's too much about that. But, you know, and I've got to give a shout out to ShmooCon. The first HackerCon I went to was ShmooCon. And one of the things that's amazing and continues to be amazing is that the Shmoo group, 
in particular Bruce and Heidi, do Own the Con the last day of the show. And they Own the Con is a talk they do every year, and they explain what they've done, and, you know, they talk about budget and what went right and what went wrong, and it's a one-hour session that's that's a master class in running a hacker con. Hmm. And I was just really thrilled with the, the Schmoo group and the people there, and, you know, both personally and professionally, ShmooCon has been incredibly important to me. I don't know that I would have stepped into the B-Sides fray to be one of the people that made it happen. I wouldn't have been as eager to step into that had I not seen what things can do. Interesting. Uh, but also, you know, I, I've got to say that the Schmoo group and, and the conference itself, the people that have been there have been with me through some of the worst times in my life as well, personally. I, I think it as have the, you know, the B-Sides family, but um, ShmooCon has been pivotal in ways that are not really obvious to people because you see things, you meet people, you have conversations, you know, and, you know, it looks like the one uh, in January will be the last Shmoo yeah. Con. And I, ex I expect to be there, but I will be lobby conning it because I'm, um, I'm over two years since retirement. I uh, really can't see the value in going to talks that aren't going to really interest me and especially since it's going to be hard to get tickets harder than ever. <laughs> right. The idea, the idea of taking a ticket away from someone who uh, is there to learn instead of mm. just connect would, I mean, that would be irresponsible of me, honestly. Um, I, I love it. It'll keep me out of some of the things, but uh, no, so ShmooCon is, you know, it, and if it weren't for that, and by the way, Bruce and Heidi and other members of the Shmoo, Shmoo group have been really supportive of, uh, you know, B-sides in their communities. Well, I've, I've so, never been actually. And so I'm, I'm going to make a point of trying to go this time. So, and I'll just do lobby time. Uh, you know, uh, the, sometime we won't take up an hour of, of a one hour podcast talking about the schmoo bus, but you and I can talk about the schmoo bus. Cause that was, uh, that's nothing like having a rented RV full of hackers from the Boston area, including folks that, you know, from CDC and loft, you know, Fred Owsley, Space Rogue, uh, others have made that trip. Chris Hoff, Zach Lanier Quine was, you know, I, I'm trying to, I can't even remember how many people, but for several <laughs> years I'd rent an RV, fill it with hackers, drive from Boston to Washington, D.C., uh, disgorge it, a bus full of hackers in uh, D.C., do the hacker con thing, and then drive home. Sounds like a Ken Kesey kind of thing. Yeah, it's it, yes, uh, <laughs> seventy mile an hour, give or take, uh, land parties, <laughs> uh, you know. Uh, so, yeah, Shmukon. But, you know, that that's one of those things that was a catalyst for me. But, uh, you know, as far as other things, like uh, the, the a lot of the Loft crew have become friends, became friends later as like through Source Boston. I met a lot of people. Uh, Space Rogue and I worked together at Tenable. He joined us at Tenable for a few years. When I was at Astaro, I supported him when he when he tried to revive Hacker News, uh, when he revived it for a while. Folks like Weld have uh, become good friends, and you know, there's certainly a variety of those people. But as I said, when they were uh, doing the things, uh, the, the beginning of the things that made them famous, even though I was in, in Boston and Cambridge regularly for tech events, I wasn't part of their, their world. Mm -hmm. uh, we became friends later. The hacker scene has changed uh, a lot over the last 20 or 30 years. And of course, you know, society has too. So <laughs> you were talking a little bit about this, but what do you, what do you miss about the old days and you know, how are the hacker cons different today than they were when they first started? What are some of the major looking back? What are some of the major differences between the way they were? And I'm sure some of this is because they were small and they were new. And as things get older, they have to mature. Je you know, Jeff Moss talks about this sometimes too, but it, you know, what, what do you miss about the old days and what is, what has changed some mostly since it started? So some of it's easy to talk about scale, right? Mm -hmm. As things get bigger, they get they get different. I think that one of the things f that I will say to people, even though I, I don't go every year, I won't be in Vegas this year. I was there last year, but I, I didn't do DEF CON. I had some other things that I had to deal with uh, life. Um, but I will say this about DEF CON. If if you miss the old DEF CON and think it's just too big, what you need to do is go hang out in the villages mm -hmm. because they're little microcosms of people who are passionate on a subject or a narrow range of subjects. And you can have that sort of quality deep dive. I'm not saying that the content isn't great. Right? They have great content. It, it just can be overwhelming. Yeah. And if that's a challenge for you, man, check out the check out the villages because the villages are 
you know, they're, they're cons within a con. Uh, many years ago, Bruce Potter made the offhand comment, which has stuck with me forever, um, that uh, DEF CON had become a meta event, right? Because, yeah. you know, Black Hat spun off from it. B-Side spun off from Black Hat, which spun off from DEF CON. You know, things like Toxic Barbecue, The Shoot, uh, now Diana Initiative. There's so many things that would not be there but certainly wouldn't be there in the middle of summer. For, mm. uh, <laughs> I was in Vegas in April, and you know what? You can go outside. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. I, I went to Valley of Fire and got out of my car. Uh, I went to Red Rock Canyon and got out of my car. Uh, but anyway, um, uh, so there's one thing. Um, commercialism. And I'm not saying that DEF CON has gone commercial, but the industry has gone commercial. Finding bugs is a business mm, model. True. Right? You know, the, and bug bounties are, it's a whole can of worms. We're not going to go down there. But bug bounties, the idea is brilliant. Uh, the first time I heard uh, Casey on the Risky Business Podcast talk about his idea, I thought, man, that's either going to fail in weeks or uh, it's going to change the industry. I hope it's the latter and it, it has changed the industry. But, you know, the commercialism, uh, there's money in it. Also, something that's kind of a trickle on is because of the visibility that you get commercial corporate bug hunters corporate research teams are out there and they're doing it for publicity and corporate glory and also mm. personal glory. And I may offend some people, but a lot of corporate bug hunters are terrible hackers. Mm. I don't mean that they're not skilled, but I mean that they are, you know, they, they hide behind their disclosure policies they won't try to find people. And then if you look at some of the really high profile hackers, people that you think would be hated at Microsoft, uh, you know, it, it, Tavis, Ormandy, Tavis mm -hmm. is too busy. But if you've seen things, uh, you know, but when I was still using Twitter, you know, Tavis would pop up and say, hey, do I know anybody at this company? And we would all be like, oh, shit. But. <laughs> <laughs> what that means is that he probably sent an email or yeah. wherever he was working at the time, sent an email to security at, mm -hmm. right, and didn't get a response. Like when he found problems with LastPass, he went out there and was like, does anybody actually use this thing? He's like, oh, no. Okay, apparently people use it. I need to talk to somebody, right? If Tavis can find the time to go out and, like, look on LinkedIn, ask on Twitter, ask his friends. And, and you know, that's just the first name that came. There are a lot of people that are... I don't know. This is something is hackers first and then whatever else later, maybe mm -hmm. that's something is of me. Um, <laughs> but it's like, oh, that's it. Uh, especially in, in, in tech companies where uh, there's probably a, a Slack or Teams instance where you could say, I don't suppose anybody here knows anybody over at this company, do you? Right. And so that's got us back into this disclosure debate as part of it. It comes up with, it's like, well, we sent it to info at whatever sale, you know, we sent it to um, security at and didn't get a response. And then we sent it a week later and didn't get a response. We sent it a month later, didn't get a response. So we dropped it at 90 days. It's like, uh, you know, that's the product name, not the company name, right? Oh, well, my <laughs> bad. It be, um, you know, the, so that's part of it too the commercialization and um i've got a point to the pr teams for that the marketing and pr teams just don't understand how significant community has traditionally been in our world well the other and, weird the other weird thing too is i'm seeing is because there's these pwned own contests and and yep. and people are presenting at places like black hat that a lot of these bugs that they they're finding they're holding on to for months, often at a time, a time, because they want the big reveal to be on the big stage right. at Black Hat or one of these things. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I mean, that's always kind of been a thing, you know. Once once these started happening, but it used to be people used to you know show up at DEF CON and burn things to the ground on stage <laughs> for the fun of it, right? You know, and that's not there. And I, I don't know. Is it better? Is it worse? I don't know. It's it's different. Um, <laughs> it's different. You know, there are a lot of people in the industry that don't have 
any sense of history. Um, it's why I started not for the hacker side of it, because I feel people that have been involved in the hacker side longer than I have, um, you know, should be the people that do that. But I have a wiki that I've since neglected of, uh, you know, foundational figures in our industry mm. going back to, you know, going back to people like Willis Ware and, and back then and then coming forward. And I've, I've kind of stopped I, dating in the past couple of years and I need to jump back in. But, you know, there are a lot of people that don't know our history and do they need to? I don't know. Um, but we have a lot of people that uh, completely dismiss what came before. And that, you know, that's, that's, to me, that's problematic. Uh, and uh, there, the commercialization has done things and it, it's, um, I look at it like this. Those of us that have ever found anything, and I'm certainly not a bug hunter. I'm not a coder or anything. But if you, especially if you were playing with computers decades ago, you just found things that were wrong, right? <laughs> I mean, it's it's been two years since I found a public utility website where when I logged in, my account number was in the URI <laughs> and incrementing it. Might have theoretically. I didn't do it. I wouldn't mm. do that. Uh, uh, show me somebody else's account, right? I mean, mm -hmm. if you just look, if you have that curiosity, you find things. But, you know, when you find things or when you figure stuff out, just trying to get stuff to work, there, there's like two kinds of people oversimplifying, but there's two kinds of people. You figure something out. And you're like, yeah, I figured this out. That's clever. I'm really clever. <laughs> And uh, what's important is like, I don't know what the timeline is, a week later, 10 days later, two minutes later, uh, let's say a week later, a week later, you look back on that and you think, huh, if I had only thought about it this way, I would have done it in half the time. Huh. Why did that take me so long? Why did I? Oh, that's, that's obvious now in retrospect. Huh. I wonder how many other people have figured this out. I want to hang out with you if that's the way you mm. look at the world. If a week later you look back on it, and, damn, I'm good. Um, it's like, <laughs> oh man, no, you know it's. Um, and if we're going to go down that rabbit hole, let's talk about people who give talks at conferences. There are two types of people. Hacker cons almost exclusively have what I think are the good kind. Uh, political uh, is almost exclusively the other way. Um, it's like the old joke about cats and dogs. You know, cats think look at you and say. He feeds me, he cleans my litter box, he takes care of me, I must be a god. <laughs> Do dogs are like, he feeds me, takes me on walks, uh, combs my hair, I must, you know, he must be a god, right? Or mm -hmm. she must be a god. There are people that get in front of an audience and look out there and be like, wow, look at all these people here to see me, I must be amazing, <laughs> right? And then there's another group who are like, uh, oh no. Man, I better nail this. I owe them this. I don't know why I'm up here. Maybe it's, you know, imposter syndrome. I don't know why I'm up here, but man, I better do the best I can because these people are giving me their attention. And um, that's one of the things that I think we see more in in a real hacker spirit. So I think there's more of that at DEF CON than there is at Black Hat. There's absolutely more of that at uh, DEF CON than there is at RSA. Sure. Right. You know, and and another thing about, you know, since I've said RSA, let's not forget that started out as uh, those three dudes who changed privacy and security mm -hmm. forever. And now it's not that. Right. Mm, right. <laughs> and you're if you work in the business, uh, you're you're encouraged, shall we say, to submit, you know, two, three, eight talks a year to Black Hat and RSA and info security um, to lesser extent info security and the one that they pick, if they pick one, may not be the one that you're passionate about, right? Right. DEF CON, B-Sides, you know, ShmooCon, Cansick, uh, you're probably going to submit one, maybe two, and there's stuff you care about. And, man, it it shows. No yeah. matter how little polish, no matter how uncomfortable you are on, on stage, it just shows you actually care about what you're talking about. And the and, audience cares, you know, too. I mean, the, the give and, and take. Right, and it, it engages people. And that's that was you know, one of the first things about B-Sides yeah. and ShmooCon. If you actually care about what you're talking about, people want to talk to you about it, right? You go from high-quality content to high-quality conversation, which builds community. You build your community. You start advancing your people's careers. It's it, you know it, it snowballs into good stuff. <laughs> 
So to me, that segues perfectly into one of my next questions, and that is what, how do you define a hacker? What is it about somebody that makes them hacker? What proclivities do they have? And for me, to, to build on what we were just saying, when I go to these conferences, what I get overwhelmingly is that people are there to learn and to teach, and, and they are more than happy. One of the stories I told uh, when I went to uh, DEF CON for one of the first times is that yeah, they have stickers everywhere, right? We love our stickers. And one of the stickers laying on a table somewhere was noob. Uh, you know, and I'm like, who would, <laughs> my first thought was who would put a sticker on something that says noob. And I'm like, wait a minute, we're all noobs at some we're point, all noobs. <laughs> you Absolutely. know, and that, and that, that I thought that would perfectly encapsulates this actually. And, and that is the, that one of the vibes I love about these conferences is that everyone's there to learn. And if you have something that, you know, that you could tell someone else, people are there to listen and they love it. And they don't care about your presentation style. They don't care about how good you are with PowerPoint. In fact, a lot of times I think a lot of that, that's often looked down upon, uh, so anyway, back to the original question is, you know, what do you mix up a, a hacker? Like the, to to paraphrase Jeff, Jeff Fox, where you, like instead of you might be a redneck, you might be a hacker if like, you know, what, what are the things that you notice in hackers that you don't see in quote unquote other people? So I think there are a lot of people who are hackers who would never call themselves that. Mm -hmm. And in the hacker world, we wouldn't call themselves that. But I think that there's there's one absolutely critical component which is curiosity and it tends to, some people are highly focused in their curiosity um and this may over you know this may intertwine with neurodivergence that uh is a, a thing for a lot of uh, folks in our world but curious about all sorts of stuff curious about all sorts of stuff but it's not just curiosity man you could end up being an academic or or something terrible like that. I know that. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah. um, you, it's then taking the next step. It's not just, I wonder what would happen if we push that button. It's pushing the button, right? And so what do I mean when there are a lot of people out there? All right. So, uh, you know, it, it's it's changed. It's computerized. You know, if, you, if you're uh, out on the street and you see a, a young guy with a, Honda, and instead of a passenger, he has a laptop um, mounted on the seat, you know, on a frame uh, over there that he occasionally fiddles with. Don't race him. Do <laughs> not race him. <laughs> You're going to lose. Uh, but if we go back a hundred years, people were like, I wonder if I can make my car go faster by taking the muffler off. I wonder if I can play with fuel mixture, ignition timing. I wonder if I can change gearing. I wonder if I can make my car, let's push it until it breaks, fix it so that doesn't break again, push it until it breaks again, repeat, you know, so that the hot rodder mentality, mm -hmm. uh, which has, you know, grown, uh, you know, also has gone very commercial. Like a tinkerer, right? Right. You know, it's, uh, it's, you're curious, you look at things and you wonder why they work, the, you know, how they work. And you wonder if there's a way to do it. And it doesn't always have to be all of that. It could just be, man, you know, like a lot of people in our communities started out with, ah, man, this game's beating me. I wonder if there's a way to, f man, if I, you know, if I just had two more lives, I could save the princess or whatever, right. you know. Um, and then you start wondering if there's a way to do that. And it's like, well, we got all these things that plug into the back of it. I wonder if I could do anything with any of them. Uh, and the next thing you know, you've got an oscilloscope out or, <laughs> you know, you're on you're on the forums and you're sharing tricks and, right. you know, th those things. It's um, it's curiosity followed by uh, experimentation, I think, is um, it's not just curiosity and it's not settled with oh yeah if you do that this will happen it's like really yeah every time yeah hmm. what if i do this instead well I, I don't do that <laughs> yeah <laughs> why you know and, and there are a whole bunch of people who are like why would you do that it's like um the accountants conference is uh down the street at the link it's uh, not here <laughs> right right <laughs> do this, not that. It's like, Ooh, you've now told me. So yeah, that's, that's a, a really vague thing. But I think that that mindset is out there of being curious about things, pushing limits, 
and then experimentation. It, it goes in a lot of directions. I mean, there are people that have focus on how to break things. Um, and, you know, that's one of the challenges that, that the industry has. And it's one of the challenges that we have with things like Black Hat, where offensive security really takes the um, the focus. And it, the reality is that uh, we have broken systems. Uh, things change faster than we can keep up. And so we just have to keep trying to patch them. But it means that we never address fundamental issues. One of my favorite quotes about hackers is one of the first things I learned to break is assumptions. And I think yeah. that, 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 yeah, that, that that's, says a lot. Uh, that, that's, that's, that says a lot. But, you know, the, the whole offensive model has, I think, in some ways uh, bogged us down. There are a couple of things that I think that, uh, you know, have, have really set the idea of security back. Um, mm. There's a book. Um, it's called A Vulnerable System. And it is by um, Andrew Stewart. It's a few years old now. And he's part of the it was part of the new school um, with Adam Shostak and that crew who was involved in some of the earlier stuff there. And he just takes a, a really hard look at offensive security. And I, if you read the book or listen to the audio book, you will be offended. <laughs> and that's good. Yeah, it, it'll offend you no matter what you believe. Even if you completely agree with them, you'll find things to pick on. But it's the overall idea. And, and in fairness – we got to patch our stuff, but let's be real. Um, even if I remembered all of it, uh, none of my knowledge of fixing broken Wins replication in Windows NT4 is of any value right now. Mm -hmm. But I had to know that at one point in time. I had to know how to activate the TCP, load and activate the TCP IP stack on Windows 98 once we had to connect things to the horrible system that we have um, once they had to be connected. But, you know, so we have a lot of uh, transient knowledge. And, um, I, you know, there are a lot of things that have gotten better platforms and stuff. But some of the early papers are uh, informative on how far away we are from being able to do it. And, you know, honestly, uh, operating systems have gotten profoundly better mm. at their heart. And then people like Microsoft do stuff like recall and throw away the gains of a decade. You know? All right. So before we go, uh, if I'm interested, if, I, if everything we've talked about today is per piqued by interest, what's the best way to find you know, one of the B sides that's closest to me? And you've already talked about some other conferences, but if, you know, if, if, if you can't find a B sides or if you want to try something else, if someone hasn't been to a conference, which yeah. ones would you might recommend people go if you're hacker curious? Go to a local event. B-Sides is the world that I live in, but there are a lot of other great events out there. So a couple of things. B-Sides.org, B-S-I-D-E-S.org, goes to our wiki that we hate and doesn't support <laughs> HTTPS on custom domains. So you'll get a warning. <laughs> but it's a volunteer project, and we have people trying to migrate us off in their spare time. If you know any good web developers who have spare time, <laughs> they're probably not actually good web developers, <laughs> nothing personal. Uh, so uh, that's that. And on that page, you'll find a list of upcoming events and an embedded Google Calendar. And you can just go to that Google Calendar. You can reach out to info at bsides.org. Uh, just info at bsides.org. And if you've got an interest, if you have specific questions, one of us will answer. Just be patient because it's all volunteers. Mm -hmm. uh, and everybody but me has like jobs and stuff. <laughs> and I am uh, probably under a Jeep or on a motorcycle or in the forge or uh, like last week was up in the Appalachian Mountains making stuff. <laughs> um, so. Yeah, just be patient. But uh, the other thing I, I will mention, because uh, they're, they're a part of and actually adjacent to the B-Sides community, there's a website called InfoSec Map, just hmm. InfoSec Map. And Martin, who runs that, is probably going to launch a B-Sides himself in Argentina. But InfoSec Map has um, all the B-Sides are listed on there and all sorts of other InfoSec conferences, and including – you know, um, they're working on getting all of the uh, call for papers information, call for volunteers and stuff. So that's another good resource. But besides.org and accept that uh, we're all volunteers. And yes, we, believe it or not, we, we dislike the wiki even more than you will, uh, which is hard. Uh, we're trying to get off of that. 
And here's here's something that I will say too. If you're curious, maybe go to an event, go to a B sides in particular. But if you're curious and really want to be part of the amazing communities that we have around the world, volunteer, mm. be part of it. You know, to be honest about what time you you know how much time you can commit. Be honest about what skills you have. You know, if if somebody's looking to you know runs their own network for a conference. You know, tell them what your skill set is in networking because it may be really simple network or it may be one that actually requires you to be a network engineer. You know, so don't mm -hmm. overstate it. But what you do is you you become part of the family. And that's not just B-sides. But, you know, again, that's that's my world. But B-sides happen because of everyone that's involved, speakers, sponsors, staff, volunteers, and everyone who comes and, and participates in the community. So, um, you know, find one. And if you're not sure if you belong there, you belong there hmm. because you need to find out for yourself. And if the answer is, nah, this isn't for me, that's okay. But now you know, mm -hmm. right? But be open, have conversations, talk to people. You know, you're talking about teaching the word I always use. Uh, I mean, after years in the industry and going through an IPO and all of that, I am, uh, you know, bitter, cynical, disillusioned, and yet somehow still idealistic. Um, and words really matter to me. And I use the word share more than teach or mm. anything because that that kind of – the idea of sharing is is more mutual. And as much respect as I have for teaching, particularly in this country, the educational system has uh, damaged the profession and the word, I think. So if we share what we know – we move forward together, not to get all kumbaya, mm -hmm. uh, idealistic old hippie, but, um, <laughs> you know, <laughs> there is a tree of life tapestry hanging behind me here. Yeah. Um, and the, the further I get from IPO days, the more idealistic I become again about the people, not necessarily the industry, the craft of, of computers. Yes. But, um, the people are why I continue to do things. That's my last connection to the industry. But it's it's really not about the industry at all. It's about the people that I have, you know, here we go. It's the people I've met along the way, you know. Yeah. The, the yeah. friendships and families that have uh, been spawned by these things. And that's not nonsense. I, I mean, I'm, I'm full of but whatever. But uh, that's that's for real. I mean, these these connections that we've made in the hacker community, not just in B-sides, but again, that's my world. I've been with people through some ugly stuff. People have been with me through ugly stuff. We become chosen family. And that is something that I've that I talk about all the time. What I it, there was so patently obvious to me when I went to DEF CON for the first time, unlike any other tech conference I've ever been at, was that is that community. And it you can't. It, it is. And. Uh, I'm gonna. Here's a tangent, and we can close after this tangent if you want. So the phrase "blood is thicker than water" is often used, and it's misused because that's an excerpt of the phrase. The original phrase is, "The blood of the covenant is thicker than the water of the womb," which flips the meaning. Mm. The original meaning: the blood of the covenant, the commitments we make, our chosen commitments are thicker than family ties or the water of the womb. <laughs> and that does completely flip the meaning. <laughs> and if I think about who I have been around to support when others didn't and who the number of people that have supported me through my wife's cancer journey and death, my son's cancer journey and death. Yeah, no, that's the communities that we build, the, the chosen family, uh, that we end up with is why I do this and why I I remind myself when I get frustrated with people or things. It's like, nah, these these are people. These, these are family. Well, I can't think of a better way to end it. That was a great talk. Thanks for coming on the show and giving us your story. That was wonderful. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me on. I'm really, really happy to have met Jack uh, in person. He's such a such a nice guy, and that was such a fun interview. We we've had the opportunity to talk beforehand. We almost kind of did this entire interview actually in a in a video call before this when we were talking about what we were going to talk about. 
And I had the chance, a wonderful chance to meet him on a few occasions, most recently at the B-Sides RDU, which is the Raleigh-Durham B-Sides conference. And I know he's not going to Vegas this year, but uh, I hope I get another chance to hang out with him again. So I said I would circle back to a couple things. So in, in, in case you're interested, the double secret probation reference, uh, it's, it's from Animal House, the movie back in the 70s, which I have not watched in years. I don't know if it'll still hold up, but uh, uh, I should probably go back and check that one out again. That was a classic. He talked about the B-Sides uh, pool party, which they always used to have pool parties at DEF CON too. Uh, in the old days, they were uh, infamous pool parties where many things got wrecked and Several people were not clothed. Lots of drinking. Uh, I, I missed out on all those days, unfortunately. But I, I've read the books. I've heard the stories from a few people who have actually been there. But the pool party for B-Sides is not quite that crazy, but it is a lot of fun. And that's something I look forward to uh, every year I go. If any of what we discussed today was at all interesting, look for a B-Sides near you. You might be surprised. You could go to that website that he mentioned called infosecmap.com. There is a link in the show notes because there are other local conferences uh, that are similar, actually, and in, in vibe to some of the to the B-sides as well. Uh, one of the ones I like to go to locally around here is called Kakalaki Con. Shout out to those guys, including Base 16. That's another really fun one that just happened a couple months ago here. But they're really interesting. So find one of these. They usually don't cost much money to get into. Go in, just kind of wander around a little bit. There's usually like a lockpick village. It's kind of fun. You can learn how to pick locks. There's often a hardware village where maybe you can learn how to solder. And there's some really interesting talks. And a lot of it, honestly, is just the vibe. So if you get a chance, find and support your local hacker conferences. ShmooCon is a big one. It's been on my hacker bucket list since, <laughs> since I created one, which sadly was not that long ago. But this is the last one. Next year, as you said, is, is going to be the last one. So I'm definitely going to go. It's nearly impossible to get a ticket to go to ShmooCon, but apparently what they call LobbyCon, which is all the people who just show up without a ticket, there's still a lot of socializing and, and fun things you could experience, apparently, without actually having a ticket. So I'm going to give that a shot. It, and since Jack does know the folks that founded it, I'm I'm angling with him and some <laughs> and some other people. I would love to interview the founders of that. And what a great time to do that would be at the last show. So we'll see if that happens. All right. So the patrons on Thursday will get some bonus Q and A with Jack. Uh, I think it's like another forty minutes. We we re <laughs> we really talk about a lot of stuff. Now we dive into some of his hobbies and things like that. So he likes to fix up jeeps. He likes to work metal on the forge. He likes to build guitars. He's got quite the interesting set of hobbies. We'll also get some other hacker stories, uh, history stories from him, most of which are more personal. And also I will be sharing with my patrons Jack's insider tips for food and fun in Las Vegas, Nevada. So hopefully that is not the last time Jack will be on the show. I'm sure we've got many more fun things we could discuss. Okay, uh, a couple things real quick before we go. First of all, again, thank you to everyone who participated in the book surge campaign. Uh, we did do some good there. I very much appreciate that. Uh, going forward, of course, I could, could always use more reviews and try to get that average rating up. But I've got some other ideas in the works for other aspects, like uh, trying to reach more people with this podcast, trying to reach more people with my newsletter slash blog. And I'm actually thinking about crowdsourcing some of that, picking your guys' brains, maybe having even a contest around this for people who can help me find interesting ways to promote all these things and for me to reach more people. So if you've got maybe some thoughts about that, especially unique thoughts, there's, there's a ton of marketing stuff out there. I've read most of it. I'm looking for, I'm looking for some unique ideas maybe some things that were, maybe some things that would work particularly well for this type of podcast, which is kind of unique. So if you're in the shower and you get some fun ideas or driving around the car or whatever, Jot those down somewhere and uh, stay tuned. Uh, I think I'll be asking your, I think I'll be asking for some of your opinions on that as part of a promotion coming down the line. So next week, I will be in Las Vegas, Nevada. In fact, by the time you hear this, there's a good chance I will already be on the ground. It is going to be ridiculously hot uh, as usual. Temperatures uh, every day, well over 100 degrees, sometimes pushing 110 Though, thankfully, for the most part, I will be inside most of the time. But because I'm going to be in Las Vegas, next week's show might be a little different. Uh, in the past, I've tried to pre-record that show, so it's just kind of already done before I even leave. Uh, but next Monday is going to be a news show, and I'm, I'm going to try to actually do the news show from Las Vegas. I'm bringing my portable recording rig with me. 
But I hope to do a new show where, you know, I'll cover the important security and privacy news, including some of which will undoubtedly originate at the conferences that I'll be attending. So maybe we'll get really lucky and I can actually interview some of the people uh, who broke some of this news. We'll see how that goes. It's always a crazy week. I, I always have grand ideas about things I'm going to do when I'm when I'm there. Uh, and it's just so crazy and I don't ever get around to doing them. So we will see how this happens. But there will be a show. It will come out next Monday and it will have some content, at least from B-Sides and DEF CON. Now, for some reason, you're going to be in Las Vegas next week. Shoot me an email. You know, maybe we could find some time to get together. And if you happen to be a patron and you happen to be one of the patrons with a Dragon Challenge coin and you'll be in Las Vegas, that would be a great time to cash in on your free drink. All right. So off to Las Vegas, Nevada. Take care, everybody. Stay safe out there. And until next week, as always, don't get caught with your drawbridge. Yet.